Let's talk about the China threat here. When it comes to the Chinese Communist Party, it's actively committing at least one, if not three, by my count, personal count, genocides. We know it's antagonistic to the United States and frankly to freedom in general, right? It's an authoritarian system. But you're basically, you're saying the people that can help aren't fully aware of that reality. And you want to bring them on board. I, 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 want, to, I want to reiterate this again, yeah. right? Um, there's probably a lot of uh, concern about revealing certain elements of classified information uh, in this reality, especially uh, to folks who might not treat it with the respect that it should be treated with. I mean, this is what some people in DOD might be thinking, right? And maybe the reason for overclassification. So how do you deal with that question? Well, you have to find a balance, right? I think we can uh, easily declassify things by removing how we got to know them, uh, removing some of the details. You don't have to give all the details of the story for people to be able to grasp what's going on, right? And so I think we do a poor job also at um, uh, cutting classification um, uh, documents so that uh, maybe the entirety of the document is not classified and then you can easily extract pieces and uh, help people uh, have access to those um, pieces that, that should be enough for them to understand the threat. And, and quite honestly, um, I found many times that um, we classify things that I already knew on the commercial side and things that um, you, know, you can find on Google. Right. Um, so, so clearly we are over classifying, no doubt. Now the, the question is, is there a real threat? Some people argue right now that me talking publicly about all of this is creating what we call OPSEC, operational security risks to the, to the United States and the DOD. I argue that if we think that it is the, the extent of knowledge and access to information of, of, a, of a country like China, we are drastically underestimating what they can do with their intelligence. It's foolish and ridiculous to even think that they wouldn't know anything I just said today, right? Uh, it, it makes no sense. The reality though, what's the real fear that no one is going to be willing to say is that if people stop being able to talk about these things, then one day someone is going to have to be held accountable for making these mistakes. And, and they know that it might be them one day, right? So by keeping things in a family, as they called it, which I did for three years, I, I kept it and I tried my best to convince everybody very nicely for three years up to the point where now we're running out of time and our kids, your kids, my kids are at risk here if we don't wake up. What is the cyber threat from China and perhaps other bad actors? Explain what that is to us. The cyber threat is tremendous, right? Um, I, I said that our cyber defense across the, the government and not just the DOD, um, but across also criminal, uh, critical uh, infrastructure, uh, power, water, and so on, is at the kindergarten level. And I mean it. Uh, if you compare that to the Google cybersecurity or another company, pick your, your uh, top, uh, top cybersecurity company, um, these um, uh, facilities are understaffed, underfunded. They had to connect them to internet to be able to remotely uh, manage the systems because they can't even afford to send people on site. So now we connected systems that are not designed to be connected. Uh, so you're creating a tremendous cyber risk. Um, we've seen it. We've seen countless uh, breaches around critical infrastructure, um, including uh, you know recently uh, water supply chain impacted in Florida and so on. Right. So so you see this happening already. Um, and and honestly, you know. If I'm China and I'm going to attack Taiwan one day, um, it would make a lot of sense to disable maybe some of our power. So our military will be so busy trying to make sure that we, we fix the situation in, in the United States that we wouldn't have to be able to have the bandwidth to even think about Taiwan. Fascinating and really scary. Frankly. Yeah, this is real life, right? People uh, dismiss these things as, it, as if it's in the movies, but this is the life we live. And people need to sometime um, realize that this is, this is what's going on around them. That's why uh, being able to see uh, and have more insights uh, about uh, these cyber attacks and um, the extent of 
of how deep uh, these uh, malicious actors can get into systems and what they can do if tomorrow they turn off, you know, an oil supply, like we've seen recently, where, by the way, the, the recent breach of the pipeline didn't even directly impact the pipeline. The company turned it off because they couldn't track, you know, consumption and billing. It didn't, they didn't actually hack the actual pipeline. Imagine if that happens one day. What happens? What if they can hack it to the point where they can make it explode? It's not just turn, turning things off. And, and, you know, we have a tremendous risk on the supply chain side where uh, all the chips, everything we buy is, is made in China. What stops them from putting malicious code into these capabilities where effectively they are dormant up to the point where they're not dormant anymore? Well, and, and I think there's been examples that we've seen where that those kinds of capabilities were discovered. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, are, we, are, are you concerned that these capabilities already exist and haven't been identified? A hundred percent. You know, I think we, we are doing very poorly when it comes to supply chain management. Um, we don't know where things are coming from, both on the software side, which, by the way, why would you even bother to um, try to tamper hardware and chips when you can just do the same with the sup software supply chain? You don't have to travel. You can push a piece of software across you know, millions of organizations. You've seen it with solar winds recently with massive breach. That's going to be the target of China now. They're going to go after companies that are providing services to hundreds of organizations. So by getting into them, including cyber companies, by the way, they're going to become the target because if you hack the cyber company defending uh, the other companies, you, you have the crown jewel. You can literally see everything that's going on and get into the other systems. So they are going to become massive targets there's a lot of startup, a lot of innovation in cyber. Many of these companies are doing a very poor job with their own cyber security, um, despite being cyber companies. Um, and, and really, at the end of the day, um, people are not taking seriously the supply chain risk as a whole. Uh, we see cars sitting in, in lots because they're waiting chips coming from China, right? How is that acceptable? And by the way, you want to talk about AI machine learning. How do you get to AI machine learning dominance and quantum computing if you can't have the most advanced uh, chips. It's all driven based on compute and access to the most advanced capabilities. If you're building stuff overseas, who is to, to know that they're not stealing the IP we're sending them? How is that even acceptable? Yeah, I know the most advanced uh, development from what I understand of these chips right now is in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So that's another, another pretty profound national security question. Mm -hmm. So. Let me get this straight. Are you suggesting that some of these supply chains should be repatriated? 100%. Without a doubt. We should never have let them leave. What are the highest priorities in your mind? Anything that has to do with uh, the most advanced uh, chips and um, when it comes to um, also the, the software side of the house, we need to really, and that was part of the uh, President's Cyber Ex Executive Order recently signed by President Biden, um, there's a, a, big, a big push to start tracking the software supply chain. And um, keep in mind, when you buy a piece of software, that software comes with dependencies coming from other companies, open source uh, projects, and these projects can be uh, impacted by uh, malicious actors. Um, China is uh, infiltrating some of these projects, uh, having contributors that are contributing code for years and people paying less attention to what they do to the point where they can potentially inject malicious code into the system. And keep in mind, uh, we have tools to be able to scan code, but it's designed mostly to scan bad code, meaning a developer that made mistakes right, quality issues, not so much malicious code. Uh, so malicious in behavior, you know, we have concept called a time bomb in software where that software can be triggered um, based on the date or based on the specific event to trigger itself to explode the system or turn off all the software in the system. All these triggers are very alarming to me and could be dormant for years until, um, you know, the bad actor decides to push the button and say, that's it, you know, it is time for us to activate this. Okay, so this is very interesting. So basically, you're, you're suggesting that you want to have a lot more cooperation kind of between units, but trusted units. Mm -hmm. So keep the ones, the untrusted units out, outside of the system, but develop a broad trusted system. 
Mm -hmm. Is that the idea? Yeah, and, and you know, we, we also have to pay attention to who is working for some of these companies, right? Um, and the fact is uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party is certainly sending a lot of people to our universities and to our most innovative companies, and there is a very big risk of exfiltration of data from within. Insider threat is probably the most uh, underestimated threat of all these uh, you know, top organizations on the commercial side.